with CBS uh, last Thursday, I think it was. They they uh, let out some snippets from that interview. We played those on Friday's program, and then the rest of the interview um, was made known or played uh, on Friday after our broadcast. So uh, I want to go back and refer you to uh, some of the things that this attorney general said. He he really and truly is the administrative state's worst nightmare. Uh, the New York Post said uh, today that William, William Barr is determined to unravel the truth behind the Russian lie. He's determined, and you can see it from these sound bites that we'll play for you uh, in just a little bit. We're also keeping our eye on Europe. There's more fallout from the European elections from uh, last weekend. Uh, we've got some updates uh, specifically on Germany and uh, Austria. And then for the Bible study segment, I don't think we'll have uh, a whole lot of time to cover all the details from last night, but I'll do my best to try to summarize some of the, the, the points that we made in that first, uh, that first lecture in this uh, two-day event. Also here, just before we start, I want to give a shout-out to Bradley Smithies. He is one of our many producers Bradley, you're in the same room with me, so give a shout out yourself to our audience from all over the world. Hello, everyone. That's Bradley Smith. He's hopefully you heard him. This is his last day of work, and of all places, he's in Cardiff. He's heading back to Edstone tonight with uh, the crew, and uh, and then he's off to uh, to Australia. He's a four year AC graduate. He's got his whole life ahead of him. He's been a wonderful student for a God's College, a, a truly a jack of all trades. As you can see, he's producing this program, and he's done just about everything else on the uh, Edstone campus, so we're very sad to see him go, but also very excited for him and his future uh, as well. Well, before he left for the U.K., President Trump, he made a surprise visit to the McLean Bible Church, um, headed up by Pastor David Platt, I think is his name. Uh, and this follows the, uh, the tragedy, the Virginia Beach uh, Mass shooting and uh, it was an it was an interesting scene yesterday as you had Mr. Trump on stage with uh, this preacher and we've pointed to the prophecy in Amos 7 um a number of times before and just uh, from the beginning how the really the, the religious undertones in the campaign of Donald Trump and then the inauguration uh of course you know about all of the support he had from the evangelical community most of the the catholic demographic voted for uh, for Donald Trump. He said on coming into the office of president that, uh, and really, he was he was heading up a religious uh, movement, and uh, he talked on Inauguration Day about uh, a movement like, like nothing the United States has ever seen. Uh, it's interesting, too, the timing of his uh, surprise visit yesterday, because last week, uh, Franklin uh, Graham, he's another televangelist who, who uh, called for June the 2nd, yesterday, uh, Sunday, to be a day of prayer for, uh, for the President of the United States. A special day of prayer, said Mr. Graham, and uh, he said, like no other president before him, Donald Trump is coming under a vicious attack and that he needs our prayers. We're on the edge of a precipice, said Graham. He even said that time is short, and we need to pray for God to intervene. Well, here is this, this pastor. This is part of his prayer yesterday on stage with the President of the United States. Clip one. We stand right now on behalf of our President, and we pray for your grace and your mercy and your wisdom upon him. God, we pray that he would know how much you love him, so much that you have sent Jesus to die for his sins, our sins. So we pray that he would look to you, that he would trust in you, that he would lean on you, that he would govern and make decisions in ways that are good for justice and good for righteousness and good for equity, every good path. Lord, we pray, we pray that you would give him all the grace he needs 
to govern in ways that we just saw in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that lead to peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. God, we pray for your blessing in that way upon his family. We pray that you give them strength. We pray that you give them clarity, wisdom, wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Please, oh God, give him wisdom and help him to lead our country. That's uh, Pastor David Platt uh, praying for the President of the United States. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, is the, well, coming in, he would be the last person you would expect to be heading up a religious movement. But you look at this bond, this, this, this tie that binds these two together, the evangelical community and this president, it's strong and it is prophesied. I won't take the time to go through Amos 7 in detail, but we have done that before, and there's, uh, there's plenty of material at our website, thetrumpet.com, to, uh, to help you be brought up to speed with those, uh, those prophecies, if you'd like to look into that later on your own time. Well, again, speaking of the president, he is now in the U.K., and as I said at the top of the show, no one does pageantry quite like the, uh, the British royal family, and, uh, and no one does... Uh, an entourage quite like the president of the United States. He comes over here, of course, on Air Force One. Well, Air Force One is whatever plane he happens to be on. There's always a decoy, and it's the same with the two armored uh, limousines, the Beast, as it's called. There's a decoy as well. I think they brought at least uh, three helicopters. Um, The motorcade, besides the beast, you've got the decoy, you've got an ambulance there just in case, you've got a satellite communications vehicle, you've got a a hazardous materials team, you've got an intelligence team, you've got a control and support team, you've got about a thousand people, that's his entourage, a thousand people traveling with the United States, that counts his family, the personnel, special forces, the Secret Service, and so on. So what we're seeing on display today, it's certainly not cheap, but what a, what a glorious display. Ephraim and Manasseh, an official state dinner tonight, as I, as I said earlier. All of these ceremonies at Buckingham Palace, where he's going to be there meeting with the Queen and Prince Charles. And then tomorrow, I think tomorrow he meets with more of the government officials. He'll see Prince Andrew, I believe, but then uh, he'll uh, have a conference with Prime Minister Theresa May, and this is just a a week before uh, she resigns. She's down to her last week in office, and and, uh, he he could be uh, prepared to ask her some some uncomfortable questions about uh, spying, on his, uh, his campaign back in 2016. Of course, the British were involved. Christopher Steele is British. Uh, some of the people that uh, tracked down George Papadopoulos or set him up, they were coming from the FBI, but they were also people working here in Britain with the FBI, with the CIA, with the MI6. In any event, that last meeting with uh, Theresa May, outgoing Prime Minister Theresa May, that's scheduled for tomorrow. And then, as I said earlier, you've got the, uh, the commemoration services in Portsmouth. Uh, we were anxious to get down there to see uh, Nelson's uh, victory. Uh, I'm not sure where the, the services will be. We've, we've heard that those are closed to the general public. So, as I say, hopefully we can navigate our way around Portsmouth on Wednesday before we make our way across the channel uh, through the night. Uh, for an arrival on the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings. That, of course, is uh, is this Thursday. Well, I said at the top of the show, you have all this pomp and circumstance, this pageantry, this this beauty and, and brilliance of uh, an official state dinner uh, tonight. Uh, but then you have all of the critics. I just saw on the news over lunch here, um, two uh, spectators or tourists that were there in front of Buckingham Palace. Sky News had a, had a microphone on the street to talk to them and said, hey, did you know uh, this is President Trump? And they didn't know. And uh, as soon as they were told that that was President Trump, that that was the reason for all this pageantry, they immediately, <laughs> they immediately stopped talking. They wanted to get out of there. They despise him. And so many, and in, in, in those are just tourists, 
But look at what the, uh, the, the London mayor has said over the past week or two. Look at what the, many in the media are saying. The Guardian, its editorial board says Donald Trump is not welcome in the UK. This is the Guardian newspaper, their editorial team. He's not welcome here. He shouldn't be here. Forget about rolling out the red carpet. He shouldn't even be invited. Inviting him in the first place was a crass error, says the Guardian. Following through in the midst of the UK's current political crisis is an act of gross irresponsibility. And so his visit, no doubt, will draw all sorts of protests everywhere that he goes. But here he is. Here he is. And in large part, he's here to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. History. Two brothers fighting together, Ephraim and Manasseh. And here the, the London mayor is saying that we shouldn't roll out the red carpet for him. He's a, a 20th century fascist. This is from uh, also from The Guardian. Of course, they're happy to print this. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has compared the language used by Donald Trump to rally his supporters to that of the fascists of the 20th century. In an explosive intervention before the U.S. president's state visit to London that begins today, this is quoting Khan, it says, President, president Donald Trump is just one of many egregious examples of a, glowing, a growing global threat. He says the far right is on the rise around the world, threatening our hard-won rights and freedoms and values. He's a threat to world peace. He's a threat to our freedoms. He's a fascist, quite like the ones of the 20th century. Well, right before Air Force One landed, the president tweeted out that, what did he say? (laughs) That he's foolish, he's nasty, um, he's a loser, I think it was. And, of course, then that gets all the news, President Trump's response. Not that that's the way you should respond necessarily. But you can call him anything and everything you want. And you can be the mayor of London. You can be the, the Guardian uh, editorial board. You can be politicians from right and left. You can compare him to Trump, or rather to Hitler. You can compare him to the 20th century fascists. And if he tries to defend himself, well, then he's childish. He's the one that's got the problem. He's the one that shouldn't be invited. He's the one that we should turn away well, at least you had one. A few. There's more than one. Jacob Reese Mogg, he was defending uh, the president in this spat that he had with the London mayor. Here's what he had to say, clip two. I think what uh, the mayor of London says is deeply disgraceful, that the fascists of the 1930s massacred millions of people, and Mr. Trump is the democratically elected president of our closest ally. I think that Mr. Khan demeans his office, demeans the nation. What he has said is quite wrong and deeply improper. So I think for the president to hit back uh, and say that he's a failed mayor of London, which is true, with spiralling knife, knife crime, deeply congested roads, uh, general incompetence in City Hall, uh, is fair enough. So I'm backing Mr. Trump in this row. Um, do you think we should be rolling out the red carpet, though, for this man? Yes, of course we should. He is our closest ally, the security of the United United Kingdom is closely tied in with um, our friendship with the United States. We're commemorating D-Day when American lives were lost, sacrificed to save freedom in Europe and to save freedom in the United Kingdom. We should be thanking him for what his country has done in the past. That's Jacob Rees-Mogg, who uh, says that we should roll out the red carpet and we should be thanking him in America. Seems like that's what you would expect. History, just 75 years ago. That's not that long ago. I brought this up last night in, uh, in the address. And just all of the leaders back then, from both sides of the Atlantic, that not only talked about that, that alliance between the U.S. and Britain, but also they brought God into the picture. God was behind it. God was behind that break in the weather on June 6, 1944. God was behind the liberation of the European continent. You just have to go back a little ways in history, step back and get some perspective. And as he said, 
Well, we should be thanking each other, Ephraim and Manasseh. In fact, there's so many in our nations that, that hate our history. They hate that alliance. They hate the empire. They hate the United States. And, of course, Donald Trump, he just makes for a, a perfect punching bag. Well, I mentioned uh, these elections in, in Europe, the European elections, also earlier this week. Or I guess it was last week. Today's Monday. <laughs> last week we talked about the uh, the Austrian um, political crisis, where there was a no confidence vote, and uh, Sebastian Kurz basically lost that that no confidence vote, and so they have some new elections coming up. Well, there's a new survey now that says um, Kurz is actually doing pretty pretty good. Thirty eight percent. That's the, according to the, the survey, 38% compared to 31.5% that the party won in 2017. So here's opponents, <laughs> run them out of office, there's new elections, and uh, he may come out even better than before. I guess we'll see, that, that comes up in, uh, I think in a few months, I forget uh, when, two or three months from now. Another story here from Deutsche Welle, it says uh, Andrea uh, Nahalis, I don't know how you pronounce her name, forgive me, but it says she's announced her resignation following poor results from her party at the European elections. The move could destabilize Angela Merkel's coalition. So this is the leader of the German uh, SPD party, and she's been in that position for, I believe, decades. So more instability. More instability. Her resignation, it says, as leader of the center-left Social Democratic Party and its parliamentary group, saying she would, uh, she wanted to give the party the chance to elect the next leader in an orderly way after the disastrous European election results. So she's stepping down following what happened last weekend. And then this article says a more left-leaning leader of the SPD could take the party out of the alliance, the alliance with Merkel, that is, potentially ending Merkel's chancellorship. So her, her reign as chancellor may well be coming to an end. George Friedman at uh, Geopolitical Futures, he points out how that the biggest takeaway from last week's elections is uh, that the political center continues with its decade-long retreat this is something we pointed out last week. The mainstream parties, they've been taking a beating for a decade now, Friedman says. But what is important is the fact that the election showed that the center parties are losing control over the political system, however slowly. Slowly but surely, you see, they're losing control, these mainstream parties. And the fringe parties, the far right, the far left, they're gaining a bigger and bigger chunk of the electorate. It's happening all across Europe. These are earth-shaking developments in Europe and easily, I know, easily overlooked because of the problems that uh, we're facing in Britain, in the United States. But we've got to keep our eyes on these rumblings knowing what it's leading to, Revelation 17, those ten kings coming together, headed up by a strong man coming out of the heart of Europe, coming out from Germany. Well, I mentioned uh, also at the top of the show the interview, William Barr, his interview with CBS earlier, uh, or rather at the end of, uh, of last week, and the fact that the full interview didn't play until the, uh, this program had ended, uh, on Friday. I'll come to that in just a moment, but let me first uh, refer you to an article by Sarah Carter. This is, uh, she's uh, paraphrasing from uh, Devin uh, Nunez, um, the title being Mueller's report is a fraud to target uh, Trump. And what she does in this article is she's, she's going through some of the transcripts of discussions that are referenced in the Mueller report, and Sarah's pointing out how that the things that are left out are quite revealing here again, you hear over and over again the fact that they left out exculpatory evidence, evidence that would have cleared Donald Trump and the Trump administration, the Trump campaign. 
She says ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunez, called special counsel Robert Mueller's report a fraud, citing the investiga- investigators conveniently left information out of the report to make it appear President Trump's counsel may have been obstructing justice. So they were very strategic in the way that they quoted the president's counsel, the president's attorney, to make it seem like he was obstructing justice. His attorney is John Dowd, or he used to be, and it's over this, uh, this investigation into uh, Michael Flynn. I guess it was two lawyers talking together, John Dowd talking to Mike Flynn's lawyer. And Sarah Carter writes here, Mueller's team made it appear in the special counsel's report that Dowd was asking for a heads up if Flynn planned to say anything damaging about Trump, alluding to possible obstruction by his counsel. However, now that the full transcripts have been formally released by a court order, it appears to be altogether different. Actually, the transcript shows he was saying something totally different. Imagine that. It says, in fact, it appears that Mueller weaponized the transcript. What I mean, she says, is that Mueller left out the most significant parts of the message to make it appear that Dowd, who represented Trump, was attempting to obstruct the investigation. See, they knew, they knew right away that there was no collusion, that there was no conspiracy. And so the whole thing, from the beginning, it was a setup to try to get them to obstruct, to try to trap them in other crimes. And they couldn't even do that. And that's hanging by a thread, thanks to Mueller's conference, press conference last Wednesday, as he went out there and tried to make it sound like, well, we kind of almost did have enough evidence, but we couldn't, we couldn't pursue after this because of DOJ regulations. And so it's, it's on you, Congress. You've got to take this and run with it. And, of course, that clearly contradicted what Mueller had said privately to William Barr. And he testified to this under oath. Rod Rosenstein was there as well. Others even. It says Mueller had redacted two significant portions of the voicemail message transcript which, according to numerous critics, reveal there was no intention of obstruction. Well, I won't get too far into the weeds here and give you all the quotes and the comparisons and such. You can go and search for Sarah Carter's article if you want to look at that. But suffice it to say, he was very selective in what he used and in what he deleted. And that's just one example. And like Sarah Carter brings out, what else? What else? This was a 448-page report. What else was strategically left out? What else? What other facts were manipulated and massaged like this? Well, it says finally, conveniently, Mueller kept those two significant statements out of the report using an ellipsis. Uh, And as I say, I won't get into the statements uh, themselves. But along comes William Barr, and he is pushing back, as I say. He's the administrative state's worst nightmare. He had this lengthy interview right soon after Bob Mueller's surprise press conference on uh, Wednesday. And then Mr. Barr, who was in Alaska, as I explained last week, he sits down for this interview on Thursday. We got little bits and pieces of it Thursday night and Friday. And then the rest of it aired on Friday. And here's what he had to say with this uh, CBS journalist, clip three. I mean, republics have fallen because of Praetorian Guard mentality, where government officials uh, get very arrogant. They identify uh, the national interest with their own political preferences, and they feel that anyone who uh, you know has a different opinion, uh, you know, is somehow uh, an enemy of the state. And uh, you know, there is that tendency that they know better. Uh, and, uh, you know, that they're there to protect as guardians uh, of the people. That can easily translate into essentially uh, supervening the will of the majority and getting your own way as a, as a government official. And you have concern that they may have happened in 2016? Well, I just think it has to be carefully looked at uh, because the use of uh, foreign intelligence 
capabilities and counterintelligence capabilities against an American political campaign to me is unprecedented, and it's a serious red line that's been crossed. Unprecedented action, a serious red line that's been crossed. If you remember the points made in my, my father's booklet, America Under Attack, and what happened to the church, God's church, following uh, Satan being cast down. And then now Satan's going after the nations of Israel primarily. But how did it happen? How did it happen with the church? Well, you had leaders right at the top who thought they knew better. They thought they knew better. They were arrogant, as he said here about those officials left over from Obama's era. Arrogant people who thought it was their job to protect America, even if it meant breaking the law. And think of it, using these counterintelligence capabilities against a political opponent. Barr sees that as serious. It's a serious red line that's been crossed. You see the same spirit, that same arrogance in the media. And in that interview he did on, uh, on Thursday... He called out the media as well. Here's what he said, clip four. The fact that today people just seem to brush aside the idea that it's okay to, uh, you know, to engage in these activities against a political campaign is stunning to me, especially when the media doesn't seem to think that it's worth looking into. They're supposed to be the watchdogs of, uh, you know, our civil liberties. They're supposed to be shining light on this evil activity. It's, and he's stunned. He says it's stunning to me that there was spying. And remember early on when they kept denying it. There's no spying. We don't spy. It's just stunning to him. They're supposed to be the watchdogs. He made one more statement regarding the media. Clip five. Well, the media reaction is strange. Normally the media would be interested in letting the sun shine in and finding out what the truth is. And usually the media doesn't care that much about protecting intelligence sources and methods. But I do, and I will. But I do, and I will. This is a unique attorney general. You would think the media would be more interested in this. And usually they don't care about protecting intelligence sources and methods. But he takes a different approach. He came out of retirement to restore order to the Department of Justice and the uh, FBI. Listen to what he said about how biased some of those investigators were in 2016, clip six. But it seems like you have a concern that there may have been uh, bias by top officials, say in the FBI, um, as they looked at whether or not to launch and conduct this investigation. Well, it's hard to read some of the texts with, uh, and not feel that there was gross bias at work and they're appalling and if the shoe were on uh, they're, they're, those, those are appalling and on their face uh, are very damning uh, and I think if the shoe was under on the other foot we'd be hearing a lot about it if, if that those kinds of discussions were held you know uh, when Obama first ran for office people talking about Obama in those tones and suggesting you know that he might be a you know, Manchurian candidate for Islam or something like that, uh, you know, some wild accusations like that, and you had that kind of uh, discussion back and forth, you don't think we would be hearing a lot more about it? <laughs> <laughs> there he is chuckling. It would be a whole lot different if this was uh, aimed at Barack Obama. As it is, they've targeted Donald Trump, all of this bias by top officials, gross bias, that's appalling, according to this attorney general. Damning evidence, he says. And what about if the shoe is on the other foot? This is someone who seems determined to get to the bottom of this. The New York Post says that if you want some good weekend reading, look at the full transcript of that interview with uh, CBS. The Post says calling it a bombshell doesn't do it justice. The interview is chock full of one explosive comment after another about special counsel Robert Mueller, the media, 
and Barr's own investigation of the investigators, just one after another. It goes back and uh, recounts some of the history. You'll remember this, some of you. We played this soundbite, as I recall. January 3rd, 2017. This is a few weeks before uh, Donald Trump took office. Senator Chuck Schumer, he warned Donald Trump, President-elect Trump, against feuding with the CIA. And then it quotes Schumer, who said at the time, you take on the intelligence community, and they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. (laughs) That's Chuck Schumer in January of 2017. The Post says here, perhaps Schumer knew then how far intelligence leaders under Barack Obama had gone in spying on Trump and how far they were willing to go to bring down a president they opposed. Well, they're still trying to do it. You go after the intel community. He made some strong statements aimed at the intel community, Mr. Trump did, back in late 2016. And Chuck Schumer all but threatens him, saying, you come after the intel community. He knew how it operated in the Obama years. You don't mess with intel. You don't mess with the CIA. You don't feud with the FBI. Well, he has been. And now the tables are beginning to turn. The Post says here, while there's still much we don't know, Barr seems absolutely determined to learn it all and to tell the public as much as he can. Here Mueller comes out with the surprise announcement last Wednesday, saying, I'll have a short press conference. Now the parameters are tight here. I'm not going to take any questions. And then during the press conference, he made it clear he had no intentions of testifying under oath before Congress. And then he rides off into the sunset, and right away, even while in Alaska, William Barr, he sits down for an interview to respond to the nonsense, absolutely determined to find the truth and to tell the public as much as possible. When we come back, we'll, uh, we'll summarize some of the exciting news from last night, the PAC event here in Cardiff. We're coming to you live today from a hotel room in Cardiff, Wales, and uh, we've got some, uh, some exciting sound bites left for you on uh, today's program. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. Today's free offer is Herbert W. Armstrong's book, The Incredible Human Potential. During the 20th century, Mr. Armstrong was recognized and respected by leaders in government, industry, and education around the world. He was even known as an unofficial ambassador for world peace. In The Incredible Human Potential, you will learn why man hasn't known the way to peace. Request the incredible human potential. All of our literature is free and all of your information remains secure. Email your request to td at kpcg.fm or visit thetrumpet.com. This is KPCG FM and this is The Trumpet Daily. And we are back live from uh, Cardiff in, uh, in Wales. Last night we had uh, the first night, our first event, our first uh, lecture here uh, in the Radisson Hotel um, before, uh, well, actually, I'll just switch it over to our uh, personal appearance campaign uh, manager. This is uh, Edwin Trables uh, summarizing some of the stats from, uh, from last night, clip seven. So we had a successful pack with uh, 26 non-PCG years and 49 PCG years and 70, so 75 total today and it went really well. It was very smooth. It was, it's a very nice hall here um, and and one lady was very happy that we came to Wales. She was she saw some of the other pack events and 
and she thought that maybe we would skip Wales, but we didn't. So we, she was very happy that we came, uh, which is just a great thing to be able to go slightly more locally and have people come, uh, you know, a shorter distance for them, and, and the, they really appreciated that. And it, it makes each each pack event just really special, not just because of the accents, but it's just a different kind of people and with different backgrounds. So it's really good to see that. And uh, here in Wales, it wasn't any different. It was really good, a really good experience to talk to a couple of people. And some of them had been pretty long Trump subscribers, and others uh, even had um, pretty long history with the, with the church. So it was, yeah, it was good to see. It was good to see. It was very smooth. Hopefully, we'll have a lot of those people come back tomorrow. So 26 non-PCG members, as you heard there, and uh, about twice that number of PCG members. So we had a lot of support coming from some of our brethren around London, and then uh, quite a few people came down from uh, the Edstone area, several students and, uh, and, and staff and families. Uh, since it was a Sunday afternoon event, uh, it allowed for them to get back to Edstone uh, not too late last night. I think it's about a two-hour drive down here to Cardiff, so that is one advantage to uh, this small island. You can get around to uh, quite a few different cities without too much uh, trouble. So um, we had a nice turnout. It was uh, the, l- the follow-through rate on the n- the, just the trumpet readers. It was lower than the other three uh, packs, but we did have more registered to begin with than up in Glasgow and over in uh, Belfast. So it was a slightly bigger pack in that sense, uh, but a little bit disappointing just with the percentages. We were hoping for something more like 38 to 40. Uh, as it is, we, we had 26. Hopefully it won't be too much lower than that for tonight's event. We'll be broadcasting live again tomorrow uh, from our Edstone studio, so we'll update you on uh, day two of the Cardiff pack, and um, everything will be back to normal in the office tomorrow. But going back to last night and what I uh, discussed, we, uh, we started, and I've played the audio before for the five-minute uh, video, uh, the video that uh, looks at some of those uh, statements Mr. Armstrong made about um, Britain joining the European Union uh, back in 1973 and how that uh, Britain would come to uh, regret that. And, of course, he was spot on with that prophecy. Uh, the video also talks about how that we're living at a time when the world is just besieged by crises and uncertainty. Melanie Phillips, she wrote in a, a piece a few months ago, that the fundamental reason for the impasse, uh, speaking of Brexit, is that most MPs want to remain in the EU. So here you have the people. The people spoke. They want out. But most of the MPs, including Miss May, they want in, or they wanted to stay in. And so that brought down her prime ministership and, and, and the one before it as well. Phillips says they're therefore at odds with the electorate, whose fury over the perceived coup against the people is hard to exaggerate. The people speak, and uh, the administrative state, the politicians, the leaders, whatever you want to call it, they go against the will of the people. I pointed out on the program last week, they spoke recently in Israel, and then all of a sudden there's uh, new elections, because uh, Mr. Netanyahu can't get... uh, a unity government. The people in America spoke in 2016, and yet look at how many people refused to accept the results of that election. So much division, so much gridlock, so many crises besieged by crises in the video that we played at the start of last night's event, right toward the end, the narrator says, Today the need for understanding biblical prophecy, for the gospel message, for hope, for the message Herbert W. Armstrong delivered, is greater than ever. Yes, indeed, greater than ever. More than ever before, we need to understand Bible prophecy because Bible prophecy shows us the way. Bible prophecy is our guide. Bible prophecy is how we know this is going to play out. We know where it's leading. 2 Peter 1 and verse 18, it says, And this voice, 
which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. This is Peter reminding his readers of the fact that he saw the kingdom of God in vision. Matthew 17 records that. When we were with him in the holy mount, Peter says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. He saw that kingdom in vision. And Peter believed. He believed in the return of Christ. It says, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. It's talking about the return of Christ. This day, the day dawn, the day star arising in your hearts, that prophecy is sure, the return of Christ. That's what gives us so much hope, even as we live in a world besieged by crises. In the Peter booklet, my father says that And I have made this point before, but he says that we must not let the world's faithlessness rub off on us. We must have faith in God's word. We have to believe the word of God, all the more so in these last days, because there's so many people who scoff. We had one uh, attendee last night who scoffed. I'm not sure he stayed all the way through to the end. He just thought it was a bunch of rubbish all these prophecies that we were going through. There's plenty of scoffers in the last days. It's prophesied. It's prophesied right there in Peter's epistles. Look over at 2 Peter 3 in verse 3. It says here, Knowing this first, know this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Moffat says, They mock, they ridicule. They ridicule the truth of God, verse 4 says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. See, they say, where is God? Well, it's been 2,000 years. How can you still pin any hope on the return of Jesus Christ? How can you still be talking about Jesus Christ's return? Verse 5 says, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. They scoffed before the flood of Noah's day. They scoffed in Sodom and Gomorrah. They scoff in these last days as well. But God's word is sure. And we can't let the world's faithlessness rub off on us, as it says in the booklet. We have to have faith in God's word. We need it now more than ever. The world is in trouble. Our nations are in trouble. And those troubles, as I said last week, they're intensifying. Those troubles are prophesied. And those troubles culminate in the greatest event in the history of the universe, the spectacular return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Well, from there I went into Revelation 12, which we spent some time on uh, last week on this program, that, uh, that unseen reason why troubles are intensifying. It's, uh, it's discussed in, in America Under Attack. But you think about that prophecy in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jacob's trouble, that refers primarily to the United States and British nations. Our two nations. Lots of pageantry on display today at Buckingham Palace. Pomp and circumstance. An official state banquet rolling out the red carpet. And our nations are facing the worst trouble that they've ever experienced. Worse, even worse than World War II and the concentration camps. And so we've got to keep our minds grounded 
in these keynote prophecies of Herbert Armstrong, because a time of trouble, Daniel 12.1, uses that same language, a time of trouble is coming like this world has never seen, Matthew 24 and verse 21 uh, as well. Well, I'll leave it there so that we can leave a few extra minutes uh, at the end of this show for you to enjoy the feedback that we got from several people last night at the pack here in Cardiff. We have we have day two coming up uh, this evening, and we'll have a full report on that when we get back to Edstone for the live broadcast uh, tomorrow. But with that, I'll uh, leave it to you to finish up the program today with the Cardiff feedback. We'll see you tomorrow. Well, I think uh, it was wonderful. And uh, I was uh, waiting for this day for a long time. So it was like uh, God has answered my prayer to be here. And uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get to know God more. Um, well, I think people are very friendly. And... Uh, it gives you quite a lot of information that you wouldn't get otherwise. I, I, I found it very interesting, very informative. Um, I, uh, I like Stephen Flurry's way of delivering uh, his, his message. In fact, I, I don't take this the wrong way, he's far more impressive in the flesh and on the television. Um, <laughs> And I've, and I've also spoken to a number of people here, and um, I'm, you know, really convinced by their sincerity and, you know, their genuineness. And I, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here. Yeah, and I shall certainly be back tomorrow. I thought uh, Mr. Flurry, Stephen Flurry, was very presented what he had to say very well, and in a way that I could follow. Sometimes we get almost overburdened with so much information but what he was saying was made a lot of sense and uh, I've also in, very much enjoyed and I feel I benefited from speaking to so many uh, people who've come along to assist him here today and uh, uh, full congratulations to them for the very excellent um, uh, way they performed here I would recommend to anybody that they come to one of these meetings and try and at least hear what the PCT has to say because it is very, very important. Right, well, uh, it's been great coming to this uh, personal appearance campaign. I've, I always watch Stephen Ferry every week on the uh, Kia David. It's good to meet him in person and meet so many other nice, friendly people. It's been brilliant. And, uh, I'm talking about the, the current uh, Brexit affair, <laughs> which has been intriguing me for the last three years, wondering what's going to happen. And we know it's uh, we know we're not going to be part of the uh, final ten nations or group of nations or whatever that uh, are going to uh, attack us in due course. But it would be interesting to see what happens, see exactly when we come out, whether it will be October 31st or, or later on, I don't know. But uh, it's good to hear Stephen talk about these things and remind us how Mr Armstrong has been warning us about these things that are going to happen, been warning us for decades. I seem to remember back in the 60s that he was talking about it, and probably before then. I think I think we've seen the front cover of Plain Truth back in the 1930s, more or less indicating that same, the same outcome. Yeah, tonight was brilliant. I learnt more, because I've been reading the books and everything, but I learnt more tonight to carry on further. So I'm going to take it further now.